It's live from New Orleans Saturday at 12.30 Eastern, 9.30 a.m. Pacific. Saturday's evening lineup includes remarks from Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy at the dedication of the new Whittier Law School in Costa Mesa, California, on America and the Courts. That's at 7 Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, here on C-SPAN. Now, a hearing on the organization and management of the Social Security Administration. Today's House Government Reform and Oversight Subcommittee hearing, led by Chairman Steve Horn, heard from agency officials. It's two hours. subcommittee on government management information and technology having received recessed yesterday afternoon now reassembles for the third in a series of hearings that lead from the consolidated uh, statement that was issued last week on uh, the executive branch we're here today to discuss the status of financial management practices and information at the Social Security Administration uh, this is the fourth in a series of hearings looking at financial management in the executive branch of the federal government. Two weeks ago, this subcommittee held a hearing on the first ever audit in the history of the country of the executive branch of the government. It was government-wide. Uh, there were a couple of A's given. There were a couple of B's. There were no C's. There were mostly D's and F's and incompletes. So we aren't done with the problem yet, but uh, Social Security was... Uh, the A type, and that's why we're glad to have them here this morning. So we've started exploring the status of financial management in various key agencies. On Wednesday, April 15th, a day that shall go down in history for many of us, we looked at efforts underway to address management problems of the Internal Revenue Service. And we asked Commissioner Rosati some tough questions about the persistent technology problems that have plagued that agency. And as I was doing that, I was thinking how the Social Security Administration has been ahead of every other agency in this government in terms of the year 2000 problem, where you're moving from the two-digit year that they dreamed up in the 60s when we were desperate for computer capacity to the four-digit year if we're not going to have absolute chaos on January 1st, 2000. And uh, we congratulate this agency for doing it on your own initiative. Congress didn't have to tell you. The president didn't have to tell you. You did it because you knew what the implications would be. And uh, all the other agencies can er learn an awful lot from your experience. Uh, yesterday, we discussed the need for remedial actions at the Department of Defense to cover and uh, to correct uh, long-standing and severe problems in achieving even the most basic level of fiscal accountability. Social Security Administration was the first agency to complete this year's audit. It was also one of the first agencies to have its financial statements audited under a pilot project back in 1990. In fiscal year 1997, the Social Security Administration received a clean opinion on its financial statements for the fourth year in a row. Social Security Administration has been able to provide timely and reliable information related to its financial operations, as we found in our hearing two weeks ago on the consolidated government-wide financial statements of the executive branch. Indeed, that was no small feat. I commend the Social Security Administration on its accomplishments. The audit report did specify two instances of non-compliance with laws and regulations. Despite the Social Security Administration's general success, we cannot ignore those issues. This hearing will focus on lessons learned and best practices from the Social Security Administration that could assist other federal agencies in financial management reform efforts. The subcommittee is interested in the successful actions taken by the Social Security Administration to implement the Chief Financial Officers Act, which grew out of this committee and is the law of the land. We're also interested in how the Social Security Administration is responding to the compliance issues that have been raised in the auditor's reports. And we welcome the witnesses this morning to enlighten us on some of these subjects. And I do not see the ranking member at this point. 
So we will go ahead and uh, we will swear in the witnesses uh, for the first panel. And uh, we have Mr. Dyer here uh, representing the acting principal deputy commissioner, Social Security Administration. We have uh, David Williams, the inspector general of the Social Security Administration. And he's accompanied by Pamela Gardner, the assistant inspector general for audit. And Mr. Daniel Devlin, I believe, was going to be here. Is he here? Why don't you join us at the table? Deputy assistant inspector general for audit. And if you'll raise your right hand, you swear in the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee that it's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The clerk will note that all four witnesses have affirmed the oath, and uh, we'll uh, proceed with the uh, ranking person from the Social Security Administration, uh, Mr. John R. Dyer. So, Mr. Dyer, please proceed. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. And thank you and the members of your subcommittee for this opportunity to testify about Social Security's administration's audited financial statements as contained in the Social Security's Accountability Report for fiscal year 1997. Let me briefly review SSA's financial position at the end of fiscal year 1997. For FY 97, the statement of financial position reflects total assets of $649 billion a 14 percent increase over the previous year. This increase is attributable to the steady growth of the old age survivors and disability insurance trust funds reserves, which were invested to generate $42 billion of interest income, an increase of $5 billion compared to FY96. The OASDI trust fund owned 99 percent of SSA's assets, of which $631 billion are investments that are only converted to cash when needed to pay benefits and other expenses. Revenue and other financing sources increased by 7 percent to $481 billion in 97. In 97, the administrative expenses for all of SSA's programs only used 1.4 percent of our total revenue and financing resources. SSA is committed to efficiency and has been successful in directing most revenues to current and future beneficiaries. Now let me provide some background and history on Social Security's audited financial statements and the accountability report. Social Security Administration, as an agency, has been preparing audited financial statements on an annual basis since fiscal year 1987. Fiscal year 1997 represents the fourth consecutive year that SSA's financial statements have received an unqualified and clean audit opinion. Our financial statements were prepared consistent with the requirements of the Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board, the Office of Management Budget, the Chief Financial Officers Act, and other relevant federal statutes. Social Security Administration has also demonstrated its leadership in external reporting by participating as an accountability report pilot agency since fiscal year 1995. In addition to audited financial statements, an accountability report consolidates the mandatory requiring, reporting requirements of the Chief Financial Officers Act, Prompt Payment Act, Debt Collection Act, Federal Management Financial Integrity Act, and reports on numbers of financial program performance measures in advance of the Government Performance and Results Act, GIPRA statutory deadlines, which helped SSA's ability to achieve its strategic goals. In cooperation with our Office of Inspector General and beginning in fiscal year 96, the accountability report incorporated the Inspector General's semi-annual report to the Congress. In addition to the complete discussion of management's activities for the year, the accountability report also provides a summary of significant audit and investigative work accomplished by the Inspector General. We are currently the only federal agency to incorporate this reporting requirement into the accountability report. Not only are SSA's financial statements and accountability reports financially sound and comprehensive, they are also timely. Social Security's FY97 accountability report was issued on November 21st, 1997, only 52 days following the close of the fiscal year. In issuing the report so timely, SSA's report was the only one issued early enough to be considered in developing the President's FY99 budget. The accountability report serves many customers both outside and within SSA. We view this document as an important vehicle to share the information with the taxpayers and beneficiaries, which in turn helps build confidence in Social Security program by assuring the public that taxpayer dollars are managed wisely. We proudly post this report on the Internet and have distributed nearly 2,000 hard copies to date. However, the information contained in the accountability report is not just compiled at the year end for reporting purposes. 
To make use on a day-to-day -day basis of the information gathered for the accountability report, SSA has developed a powerful tool to disseminate information to executives and managers, the Executive and Management Information System, or as we refer to it internally, EMIS. EMS is available to SSA's executives on our intranet and is updated monthly. This system tracks current year workload processing against both stated current year goals and prior year processing for many common workloads, for example, the number of disability claims processed in total and by region, by state. This type of performance measure system is vital in the shift from managing resources to managing for results as the Results Act and other recent legislation requires. The key performance measures of SSA's annual performance plan which support our strategic goals are closely uh, monitored through the EMIS. In fact, our executives meet monthly to review the agency's key executives, initiatives, goals and objectives using the performance information disseminated through EMIS. This constant monitoring is necessary to ensure management is aware of any performance trends before a compilation of the accountability report. Building on the success of previous audits conducted by the Office of the Inspector General, we expanded the scope of our fiscal year 97 fiscal financial statement audit by contracting to have Price Waterhouse, under the Inspector General oversight, audit our financial statements, systems of internal control, and compliance with laws and regulations. This expanded effort gives greater assurance that SSA is being managed both efficiently and effectively. In addition to the clean opinion we received in fiscal year 97 financial statements, Price Waterhouse also determined that SSA systems of accounting and internal control were in compliance with the internal control objectives of the Office of Management and Budget Bulletin 93-06 in all material respects. Price Waterhouse's expanded scope resulted in suggestions to improve SSA's internal control structure in areas such as protecting information, continuity of operations, software development, separation of duties, and quality control. We have already taken correction action on many recommendations, are continuing an open and honest dialogue with Price Waterhouse and the Inspector General to discuss additional actions to further strengthen our internal con control structure. Mr. Chairman, SSA wants to make it clear that nothing is more important in operating our programs than ensuring that the public has confidence in us when it comes to information that is placed in our trust. We will do whatever is necessary to assure this subcommittee and the American people that SSA's stewardship over their personal information and financial assets is beyond reproach. As you can see, we're working with the auditors to address their recommendations. I expect to have most implemented by July 31st. We do not view this as a completed product, though. As history shows, we're continuing to improve our operations and are fully prepared to meet any new challenges which may arise. We appreciate the support provided by your subcommittee, in particular in the Congress in general, and I would be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we appreciate that uh, statement. I now call on the Inspector General of Social Security, uh, David Williams. Mr. Williams. Chairman Horn and Mr. Kucinich, thank you for the opportunity to appear here today to discuss the recent audit of the Social Security Administration's financial statements. The Chief Financial Officers Act of 1990 requires that the Inspector General or an independent auditor named by the Inspector General audit SSA's financial statements. This annual review serves three purposes. It contributes to the increased public confidence in Social Security by attesting to the accountability of its resources. It identifies significant problems in SSA's control systems and recommends corrective actions. And it aids congressional oversight by showing areas where Congress can work with SSA to improve the Social Security system. Although this is the 11th year SSA has been producing audited financial statements, it was the first year an independent public accounting firm was hired to conduct the audit. The Office of Inspector General contracted with the IP fir IPA firm Price Waterhouse to conduct the audit. The IPA conducted the audit efficiently, effectively, and in a short time frame. I believe the IPA was able to conduct this audit so efficiently because of three factors. SSA's accounting function and management systems are centralized. There was a beneficial knowledge base from the previous year's financial audits, and the IPA had, had demonstrated expertise in areas covered by the audit. SSA's accounting and financial management functions are centralized, and the primary source of SSA's accounting data is internal. SSA's National Computer Center serves as its central data processing center by controlling all of the application systems that are used by facilities nationwide. 
This centralized structure combined with an internal source of accounting data provides for the efficient use of audit resources because it allows auditors to focus on one location. The IPA assigned 90 auditors whose expertise was in financial and systems auditing to conduct this audit. Because SSA's centralized accounting function has not changed significantly over the last 11 years, the auditors were able to rely on previous assessments to identify high-risk areas and plan sufficient audit coverage to review those areas. The IPA gave SSA's financial statements an unqualified opinion. An unqualified opinion represents an assurance that the financial statements and related accounting systems are free from material error and generally comply with significant laws and regulations. The IPA also found five significant deficiencies in SSA's general controls environment. These deficiencies undermine the overall integrity of elements of the data processed through SSA's automated systems. Specifically, the IPA found that SSA needs to improve controls to protect its information, improve and fully test its plan for maintaining continuity of operations, improve its software applications development and change control policies and procedures, improve controls over insufficient separation of duties, and improve quality control activities. The IPA cited concerns or instances of noncompliance with the Federal Financial Management Improvement Act and recommended that the first four of the deficiencies be reported as material weaknesses under the Federal Manager Financial Integrity Act of 1982. Citing the limited details in the first report, SSA stated that it was unable to fully respond to these deficiencies. After receiving two subsequent management letters, SSA was better informed on the basis of these problems and agreed to take action on most of the IPA's recommendations. In keeping with SSA's goal of rebuilding public confidence, the Commissioner made resolving IP the IPA's findings as a top priority. Another of the agency's priorities is the implementation of the Government Performance and Results Act, which contains a requirement to improve the confidence of the American people by holding federal agencies accountable for achieving program results. In fulfilling this priority, SSA faces several challenges. SSA must develop new ways of measuring the financial cost of its programs, which is an integral part of measuring performance. Accurately measuring the true cost of its operations is a significant challenge to SSA because of standing concerns with its existing cost accounting system and the increased expectations contained in the new cost accounting standards that were recently issued by the Joint Financial Management Improvement Program. By implementing the managerial cost accounting standards, SSA can provide adequate, timely information on the full cost of its programs. In conclusion, I believe this audit was successful on two fronts. First, it revealed specific areas where SSA needs to strengthen its financial management. And second, it gave, it gave SSA, Congress, and the public a better awareness of the adequacy of SSA's stewardship. I believe the successes of this audit will contribute to improving the oversight and operations of SSA. Thank you. Uh, we thank you. That was a very helpful statement, and we'll get into it more on the question period. Uh, Ms. Gardner, do you have anything to add to that at this point? No. Okay. Mr. Devlin, do you have anything to add at this point? Fine. Then let's uh, go to questions. Uh, as part of the fiscal year 97 audit that Price Waterhouse did, where they reported those significant deficiencies in the area of information protection, what steps has the Social Security Administration taken or planned to take to alleviate the concerns raised by the outside public audit regarding unauthorized assess, access to sensitive data? And how much of a problem is it for you? And do you have a way of measuring that? And let me throw one more factor out. Have you built firewalls within the computer system so they can't completely destroy your records in different areas such as that? Mr. Chairman, let me start out by saying that when uh, Price Waterhouse uh, did its uh, t testing of us on um, access to our data, that uh, they were not able to penetrate our systems. And that reassures us that we have the data and the privacy information of our beneficiaries covered. They did, May though, I say at that point, or is, do they have any nerds out of the local high school? I mean, uh, if these are people that are used to computing, that's one thing, but hackers are a breed unto themselves. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, we, we uh, hire outside uh, consulting groups and experts to try to penetrate us. We're constantly maintaining and updating. As you know, dealing with nerds and hackers is a never-ending business, and I lose sleep at night thinking about it, because you know there's always someone trying to figure out how to get in. 
And uh, we have an internal program that's designed to constantly update us and um, keep us beyond, hopefully, the state, even the state of the art. Uh, responding to your question of um, what they did find, though, is they did find that uh, some of our way we did have our security set up, that we didn't have all our software and all our programs covered that we should have, and it wasn't integrated. So we are now moving to make sure we do integrate all the security and all the systems across various other programs that we did not have covered. There were also uh, questions about uh, some modems that we had that uh, we should not have had, and we've been in the process of rapidly removing them. So we have been responding very quickly to these. Anything that anybody identifies that threatens the security of our databases, we jump on as fast as we can. Mm -hmm. Can they? Get, can someone get into one of the, uh, your files, one of the many tens of millions, and change the data that makes them eligible for Social Security? The only people that can do that are our employees who are authorized to do that. Today. And you, but do you know of any time that it, I am not files aware of any time that with? I'm not aware of any time that we have been penetrated by the outside. How about the Inspector General? Do you know if you've been that's, penetrated? That's our understanding as well, Mr. Chairman. And, mm -hmm. and as um, Mr. Dyer said, we, the agency contracted, um, has been contracting for some time their own uh, people to, to try to penetrate the system. And although we had confidence in them, we felt that an independent uh, firm such as Price Waterhouse should give it a last check. So this was not the first mm -hmm. effort to uh, patrol this important area. And, I'm, and I know it won't be the last. Let, let me get on the record, Ms. Gardner and Mr. Devlin. Do you have any knowledge of penetration of Social Security files by anybody outside the agency? No, sir. No, sir. Okay, so you haven't seen any files that have been tampered with? We hope never to. Okay, well, that's uh, amazing. The Pentagon has difficulty. Maybe we ought to send your team over there and uh, help them. They're uh, getting about as much money as you are, but. Uh, We'll take a look at that one a little further anyhow. Uh, what worries me, I've seen this happen to credit bureaus and credit data and other types like that, and I think the average citizen simply wants to have some assurance that once those files, which, uh, as you know, increasingly, whether the government likes it or not or we like it or not, the Social Security number is an identifier for practically everything that happens in this society. Students are registered in universities that way. Uh, many states require them, I think 23 for voting registration. Uh, many of them have uh, other uses for it in terms of the driver's license, so forth, and all the credit cards floating around. And you never know what's been taken off your credit card once you hand it to the intermediary to pay your bill in millions of places around the world. So uh, that, uh, I think, worries the average citizen. I'm glad to hear your reassurance on that, that you've never had an incident of anybody getting through into your system to do damage to it or damage to the individuals who are part of that system. We think it's very important that we do everything possible to prevent anybody accessing our databases yeah. that are not authorized. Well, I'm delighted to hear that, but I just wanted to know if there's ever been any incident. And I've got four witnesses under oath saying there never has been. Now, during 1997, current and former recipients owed the Social Security Administration more than $2.6 billion, including $1 billion in newly detected overpayments for the year. What additional procedures can the Social Security Administration implement to prevent and detect fraudulent payments for the Supplemental Security Income Program? Mr. Chair, you're referring to the um, billion dollars or so that was identified for the Supplemental Security Income Program of where That's we have correct. annual debt. Um, we are uh, putting together a, a plan to improve the management of the Social Security Income Program, which will address a lot of the issues that have been raised and brought to our attention, plus other things but that we why, think Why don't you explain for the record, because I think the average person in Congress, as well as the average citizen, isn't aware of the unique relationship uh, that the uh, Social Security Income Program has, how, uh, who administers it, what, what is the role of Social Security, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. The, the Supplemental Security Income Program uh, spends about uh, 28 billion, if I remember rightly, this year, re that range. And the money predominantly goes to low-income elderly and disabled persons. Um, it was originally created to supplement so that the elderly who uh, would not have enough money to get them out of the poverty level with just the basic uh, Social Security retirement could have the difference. 
And over years, it, it has been expanded to cover a large portion of our disabled population who really need the resources to live and survive on. And okay. there are about six million people currently receiving six supplemental. Million. That now, range. is there an estimate by the Inspector General as to the de degree to which fraud occurs in this program? And if so, what is the typical type of case that uh, is considered fraudulent? This has been a very old um, problem in identifying the universe of fraud, not just for Social Security, but for the entire law enforcement community. We don't have a sense as to um, the entire universe of fraud that exists. We do know the amount that we're able to tap into. We have the largest hotline operation in the United States, and that provides us with a lot of, of good intelligence. The, uh, we're all, we also study very closely the operations that we execute uh, in different varieties of fraud to try to understand <laughs> how prevalent uh, the levels of fraud are. And, and they, the, uh, the levels that we're encountering are the, the levels that you would expect to find for a cash benefit type of program. What is, what is that particular level that you feel we should find? The, the, um, 10 percent, 20 percent, 30 percent? Well, that's the figure that sort of always eluded the law enforcement community. Which one? Community. I gave three. The, I'm sorry, that the ability to assign a percentage yeah. to what we don't know has, we've never been able to do a good job of, and, and we're, we're sort of in that boat with Customs and the DEA and, and everyone else. We, um, no, but which, you, you don't like those figures. Are they in error? Or the, I think the general the percentages accounting that office. You yeah, I said, is it 10 percent fraud? Is it 20 percent fraud, or is it 30 percent fraud? We know, higher? we know the numbers that we're finding. The mystery is the numbers that are out there that we are not, we have not detected, and I, so that's what gives me the, the level of discomfort in us in, in supporting the any of those figures or in attacking any of those figures. What are you finding? We, we, um, have about 18,000 reports this year of fraud within our various programs. And, and as you said, identity theft is a, is a very troubling area involving the Social Security number, SSI, and then smaller levels within the SSA program. Well, there, what, what uh, programs that you administer have the most fraud in it in, a, in the number of cases, and then which has the highest percentage? The, the um, SSI program has the highest uh, percentage of fraud as far as just the, the broad numbers. And the what identity is that theft. percentage? What well, is again, we don't, of the, of, of the 18,000, I'm, I'm sorry. In other words, we do 18, have the percentages. Thousand. We do have the percentages of that. And I'm go of the 18,000 complaints we received, um, and I'd like to provide a more precise number for the record, but it seems to me that it's at about 25 percent of all the allegations we receive. And if I may, I'll... Well, uh, let me make sure I understand this. You have 18,000 possible fraud cases. These have been through the hotline, you yes, say, sir. by and large. And the 18,000 are not limited to SSI. That is all of the Social Security Administration, or is it limited to SSI? No, it's all, it's all, all three of our major programs. All right. Why don't you say what the other two are? The identity theft, misuse of the Social Security no, uh, number. All three, you say all three of your programs. Yes, that's one of the investigative programs. We have misuse of the Social Security number. The second one is SSI, and the yeah. third one are Social Security retirement programs. Why, why don't you go through those and say what's a typical example of the type of fraud mm -hmm. within each of those three programs? In, um, in the Social Security program, as I said, there, there's low but sort of persistent levels of fraud. Now, that's within th th this is SSI or Social Security retirement? This, this is Social Security retirement, sir. Okay, right. And that's your basic program, really, isn't it, in terms it's of your the, total? It's certainly the largest. The largest, uh, right. With regard to the dollars. Okay, so uh, you have how many people, roughly, in the Social Security retirement program? I'm going to ask John to, to get help a me. check. I, is it, is it's about 43 million. 43 million. Okay. And out of that, you then, can you allocate that 18,000 coming over the hotline? I mean, was this 4,000 
that are Social Security retirees, uh, or what? Do we know? Mm -hmm. We we do know, and I apologize for not uh, having it handy with me, and we'll provide it for the record. And I'll, but I'll tell you what I believe is is roughly correct. I believe it's roughly at the the 15 percent level. 15 percent of all of, of our allegations. Uh, well, 15 percent of 43 million f uh, functioning cases. What? You've of got all a of very our anxious person uh, back here on your staff that is mm -hmm. getting nervous about it. So why don't you consult and see what the answer is? Yes, she, she wanted me to reinforce, uh, Judy Chester wanted me to reinforce that of the allegations we receive, not of the 44 million recipients, but of the allegations we receive, about 18% deal with Social Security. In other words, of the 18,000 potential fraud cases, 18% exactly. of 18,000, which are the Social Security Retirement Program, your largest program, 43 million, that's that possible apportionment. You'll file the rest for the record. And can you file it for some of the past years if you've kept that for the record? Is this an yes, increase sir. in number of cases? With a hotline, obviously, you ought to get a few more cases than doing nothing about it. Mm -hmm. These are fairly stable figures that I'm giving you. Okay. Um, the SSI program is, is at about 22 percent. I think I said 25 a moment ago. And the remaining percentages, which I think are 60 percent, involve identity theft. Um, yeah, is that the illegal aliens, essentially? That's a, that's a common example, but there are also people engaged in bank fraud and credit card fraud that are also, in, that are also involved in the misuse of uh, the Social Security number. There are also a, a very wide-ranging variety of other crimes, including terrorism. Anyone that needs a false identity to perpetuate a crime in this modern age of commerce must have a Social Security number. Well, have you had a chance on past years to identify what type of identity misuse has occurred, and have you got some classifications within that basic area? I believe that we do, sir. I, I don't have those with me. I, Does I, any of your staff have it? Seems to me that's just basic data that if the commissioner's awake, he ought to be asking about, or she, whoever it is. We do uh, within within the subcategory of Social Security number fraud. We do have that data. I'm, I'm not sure I have, uh, I was just conferring with my investigative chief. I'm not sure we have that. Uh, right, I, I think you wanted a, a further breakdown of identity theft. As I no, said, I mean, that's a very large category. You're it saying is. roughly of the, eight, this is, are the 18,000 cases to which you refer simply in this current fiscal year? Yes, they are. Okay, what were the cases in the previous fiscal year on fraud? Our hotline has been growing. The proportions have been about the same, but the numbers have been growing as our hotline came on stream. We're when did office. you first establish the hotline? I, it was 1995. 1995. 1995, sir. Okay, so we have at least then three years of data. Is this a fiscal year or a calendar year? How are you keeping it? We keep it by fiscal year, sir. Okay, so that runs from essentially October 1 of one year to September 30th of the next, the federal fis uh, fiscal year, which is probably known nowhere else in the United States. But that's, we thought, you know, when we passed all these bills earlier and uh, earlier and then later and later, and uh, why, gee, let's change the fiscal year to October 1st. We're always done by that time. Now we're not done by that time either, so we've got probably a slippery fiscal year in order to make up for uh, not just a day every four years on leap year, but mm -hmm. a leap year in reality. <laughs> so, any, I'd like the breakdown of what have you got in terms of what did you find over the 95 fiscal year, which would have ended midnight on uh, September 30th mm -hmm. of uh, 95. And then we've got 96, 97, and we're in 98. Uh, so we've got three years of data here somehow, depending Correct. on when that started. 
I'd like Social Security to give us a break to how many cases, what did it eventually show? Were they half legitimate? Because people can phone up and say crazy things about anybody in America. And people faithfully write that down sometime, put it in a file, which uh, proves to be uh, very harmful to citizens that have not done anything except upset some gripey old neighbor that wants to get even with them. And uh, that worries me. I think it worries all of us in government that where government files can be penetrated and we're going to hold a, a hearing again on the medical confidentiality, mm -hmm. which uh, knows errors of unbelievable uh, violations of people's privacy and confidentiality. But we'll get to that in a couple of weeks. And we're working on it for two years behind the hearing scene. Mm -hmm. But this is what bothers me is in 95, 96, 97, did you have about the same number of calls, like 18,000? No. You didn't. We didn't. My concern, though, is that um, that's because I'm afraid that the reason for that, the intervening variable, was that we were just beginning our operation. We're a new Inspe Office of Inspector General. So um, that's, that's been growing, but I believe the reason is more that we've, we've been advertising and making the public aware that we're, we're available. Now, how do you advertise that so they know there's a hotline? We have a, um, a hotline poster with detailed information that we put in the Social Security offices, and then on our reports, it's, uh, that number is contained. What, what do you do in terms of just notifying the uh, Social Security recipient when a check goes out? Seems to me I'd put a little sheet right in that. It's issued by the uh, Treasury, isn't it? The it Financial is, Management Service, very fine organization in my opinion. And uh, I'd just put a little slip in there, like your friendly city puts it in on mm -hmm. all the good things they're doing, or well, here's a summary of the budget. Have we done that to put it in with the checks? We have not done that. Well, let's do it, okay? I'll be very I glad I mean, here's to... 43 million people that could be yes. ambassadors for you to tell the whole world about the hotline when they go to the next senior citizen meeting or the Great Panthers or whatever, or the new senior nutrition program. This is a chance to get 43 million people working for you because, believe me, they will have a lot of stories to tell. Some might be inaccurate. Most of them are going to be accurate. People aren't stupid. They see this stuff all around them. They say, I work year after year after year to get Social Security credit, and here's this bozo that uh, is into the Social Security and the money I've put in because of fraudulent use of a card. And you'd be amazed how many helpers you'd get. And if you wanted to give them some of the finder's fee, boy, that's great with Congress. Let's get them to be a few bounty hunters like the 19th century or something, mm -hmm. and maybe we'll clean up this operation. So uh, give me then off the top of your head of the staff or whoever, mm -hmm. if you've got these cases, and this is the high, I take it, 18,000 so far this year, it is the high, and those are yeah. the, as you said, yeah. those are the allegations. Right, those from are the those allegations. We, from those we open a smaller number of investigations. Right. Now, how does that work, and who, who does the investigations? The inspector general? Your shop, or is there yes, a separate sir. investigations no. shop? We have the investigative organization mm -hmm. for, the, for the agency. We, the way those are decided is that we, we do a kind of triage operation on the allegation. As you said, we, we have to be somewhat suspect of certain of the allegations. And we divide those with the agency. In, in some of the instances, it alleges the kind of allegation that would be best managed by the agency in terms of terminating the payment. Others clearly indicate intention and criminal behavior, and we take those. I'm sure my colleague will have plenty of questions to ask. If you think I've been difficult, wait till you hear him. No, I and, actually... Uh, I, he I, will I, pursue it with his fine legal mind. Oh, well, and, I appreciate uh, your so, uh, interest. Because we just started of the one of the three programs, and I'll leave to my colleague what he mm -hmm. wants to do there. 21 minutes to the distinguished member from Ohio. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Horn. And I want to uh, thank the chair for the series of oversight hearings which uh, we have been conducting in the last week. I, I think uh, the hearing on Tuesday when we looked at IRS's financial uh, management weaknesses and the, um, uh, certainly the hearing yesterday 
about the Department of Defense, which gave all of us pause about financial management there. We come to this today, and I think we have to say, Mr. Chairman, this is a bright spot, that, that, and it truly is, uh, in the federal financial audit process. So the Social Security Administration from the outset ought to be congratulated for the manner in which you uh, faithfully administer hundreds of billions of, of funds and investments in this, uh, uh, in this country. Uh, as, as the people know, the uh, SSA manages the Social Security Trust Fund and pays Social Security benefits. And when you look at the enormity of the work that you're involved in, I think it's um, uh, $350 billion in annual payments to 50 million Americans. You process uh, 225 million wage and tax statements each year for 138 million workers. You have 1,300 field offices, eight processing centers, 10 regional centers, and you employ over 65,000 people. I mean, this is a major service, a major service of the federal government. And I, I think uh, the uh, attention of the nation when it's directed to Social Security, uh, people always want to know how solid is that system and how is it run. So what is brought to us today, I think, is a financial success story, and it's uh, very good that you received that clean opinion from Price Waterhouse. I I'd like to uh, go into, uh, first, the structure of, of SSA's uh, financial position, as you reported, I think, Mr. Dyer, in his remarks. The, um, the total assets now are at $649 billion, is that right? Yes, sir. And they increased 14 percent over the previous year. So would you tell us how that increase came about? Um, that because we had uh, additional revenues coming in is basically the reason. And the revenues came from? Came from the FICA taxes and so, and interest, excuse me, I forgot we had interest we picked up too. But the FICA taxes we collect on an annual basis. FICA? The, uh, uh, Okay, the taxes you pay for your Social Security retirement. Right. And uh, on an annual basis, the amount we have coming in is, is exceeding the amount we have going out by about this year, it'll be about $80 billion. So, so, how much, so how much more money came in this year total from FICA? What were the numbers? Over what the outgo was about $80 billion. This, uh, excuse me, that'll be for this fiscal year. About what was the billion. amount of FICA that came in, though? Uh, let me give you the exact number here. Receipts was in for the fiscal near. Uh, I mean, excuse me, sir. I better I keep moving from 98 to the 97 here. What page is it? 405 billion dollars was what came in in revenue. 405 billion. And then your the money that you spent. What well, we spent in outlays for the um, OASI, um, the retirement piece was. Three hundred and twelve point nine billion. So then, that establishes the amount of money that you have in surplus. Then. That's right, sir. And that so that equals a little more than a billion a week, is it? About a billion and a half a week. In About that a billion round. and a half a week. Okay. So it's uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, now the. Uh, old age survivors and disability insurance trust fund reserves. Uh, the, uh, you have in your statement that um, the amount that was invested generated $42 billion of interest income. Where, uh, when you use the word invested, where, where are you investing? We have funds? them in Treasury securities. Let's talk about the Treasury securities for a minute. For, the, for the, the funds under the way that the statute is currently set up, any uh, funds that we have coming in that exceed outgo, they go into, as we call it, our reserve, are invested in Treasury securities. And Treasury turns around and gives us and pays us interest while we have those funds invested with them. And as you can see, we have about six, over $600 billion currently invested in those securities. And, that, and that's the so-called Social Security Trust Fund? that Reserve, yes, sir. Reserve. So there's 600? Over 600 billion in it. Over 600 billion. What rate of interest does that earn? If I remember right, it's about 7%. It goes up and down over the years historically. It's been up to 11, 12. Uh, 
I think we're sometimes down to five, depending on what the overall interest rate is. It stays well ahead of inflation, I take it? Yeah, that's right. Right now, to be exact, they're telling me it's 6.7 at this point. The um, Social Security Trust Fund is set, uh, the fund is set up in such a way as to, your, your legal mandate is to put that money into Treasury. Yes, sir. What are the Treasury instruments that they're put in, in terms of the length of time? A little bit. Um, well, they refer to as special obligations for the trust fund. And, and what, what length of time are they put in? They, they vary. I'm trying to remember. Three months, months, six months, no, no. a year? What? They're multi-year. I think they're 10-year range. 10-year. And those funds are backed up by the full faith and credit of the United States of America, right? Yes, sir. Is there anything more solid in the world than that? Not that I'm aware of. So the money which people pay through their taxes mm -hmm. to Social Security <laughs> is then invested. It's in a trust fund. It's secured. It's invested, in effect, in the United States. Yes, sir. The trust fund is secured by the full uh, faith and credit of the United States, and people can rely on that. It is rock solid. Is that what you're yes, telling sir. me? Yes, sir. And now you have an independent financial audit that says the money's being managed correctly, and the money that we say is there is there. Yes, sir. In your remarks, you, um, uh, you mentioned that the, uh, what is called the OASDI, <clears throat> Old Age Survivors and Disability Insurance Trust Fund, owns 99% of, of the uh, Social Security Administration's assets, and that $631 billion are investments. And you convert them to cash uh, when they're needed to pay the benefits and the expenses. Yes, sir. Uh, let's talk about the mechanism of that. When claims are made to, to pay out, you have to pay something out, how, how soon after the claim is made is a payment made? Well, or after an obligation is incurred? It, is a it's immediate. Made? I mean, as, as soon as uh, the, the start of the month, the pay, in essence, check day, as we refer to it, uh, the third day of the month is that the minute that check's there, it's immediate and it's charged off against us. And the money's there to be paid out. On average, we find that people usually cash a check three to five days. Okay, that's what that. I wanted to get at. So, mm -hmm. uh, in other words, the government isn't holding on to people's money. There's no float. No, no none at all. Where you're trying to none whatsoever. jack up the amount of right. and actually, money the government makes on that. You pay the money quickly. And it's uh, immediately, and Mr. And Mr. Congressman, not only that, but now with the direct deposit program we have, about a uh, large majority of our beneficiaries get it directly deposited in their account immediately because it's sent electronically through the Federal Reserve. Okay. So uh, when they're returned back after their cash, are they usually cashed within a few days? Yes, sir. Do you have many people call you and tell you they don't get their checks? Does that happen often? Yes, we, we, we do have. Uh, every month we have a certain amount of people that call and say their check was, didn't, re they didn't receive it. And some end up being was delayed in the mail for some. Others, they were lost. Others were stolen. And that's why we've been encouraging people to so, go to direct deposit to get around that. So when people don't get their checks, they're either delayed in the mail or lost or stolen? Or stolen. What's your advice to people, Social Security recipients, if they don't get their checks? What do you tell them to do? Uh, our ad advice to them, if they call us immediately, is, is usually to, we'll check to see to make sure we aren't aware of something that got delayed in the mail or whatever. But normally, if it's immediate day, we'll say, wait a day um, and get back to us. If it goes past the day, then we start to follow up. If they need emergency payment, we work out with them to get an emergency payment. How, how serious a problem is theft of Social Security checks? Uh, in my memory, and again, I'll get the facts, I think it's about 50,000 a month out, out of, of, out of four, 50 million checks that go out totally, if you also include the, the SSI program. 
How successful is the uh, administration in tracking down uh, those who are responsible for stealing checks? Um, we are very aggressive. Uh, again, our responsibility is somewhat limited there. We rely on the Postal Service right. and obviously Treasury and, and other parts of the government to track down checks. That is mostly done through Treasury. Now, I want to go back to your testimony. Um, the uh, testimony speaks again of the uh, trust uh, funds of the OASDI that owe 99 percent of the assets, of which 631 billion are investments. Those of investments, again, are the ones that are in the special Treasury uh, Treasury securities, bonds. bonds, securities. Right. Is that what you call them, bonds? Bonds is fine. Okay. Uh, and you convert them to cash when you pay the benefits. Okay. Now, I, you're all, you also said that revenues and other financing sources increased by 7 percent. Those revenues, again, are the revenues from the? Predominantly from the taxes people pay for their retirement. Well, what are the other financing sources that you? We get, uh, we get some general fund revenue. Uh, the Supplemental Security Fund is general funds, so there is some money there that we have carrying over year to year. We also get some general funds of the um, taxes on the uh, retirement money people get. Some of that tax is given to us under a statute that was passed in 83 in the Act to make reforms in Social Security back in 83. So we do have some other sources that come in through the general revenue side of the House. The, I, I note that the uh, administrative expenses for all of the Social Security programs are at 1.4 percent of total revenue and financing. Uh, tell me what goes into those administrative expenses. Okay. Uh, ba basically, the day-to-day -day running of the organization. It's the, as was mentioned before, the, we have field offices and processing centers. We have 65,000 employees, other state employees that help us. And we use those funds to get the checks out, to give, issue people their Social Security numbers, to answer telephone inquiries over our 800 number, uh, to run our financial systems, run our data computer centers, handle phone bills. All of that's what we cover. It, over two-thirds of our expenses are salary and payroll, and the other third falls into maintenance kind of things. Uh, I'd like to go back to a question about the, uh, the yield on the investments. What's, the, what's been the average yield over the past 10 years, let's say? Do you know off the top of your head? Nine percent. Nine percent over the past 10 years. Now, has there ever been a time uh, in your memory where Social Security recipients had their benefits cut because the trust fund didn't perform? No. Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. Because the money's invested in the United States of America with the full, backed by the full faith and credit of the United States of America. Yes, sir. You know, Mr. Chairman, it's, it's interesting to hear this uh, testimony for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, because I'm sure all of us have constituents who want to be assured of how solid that fund is. And, and that's something that is, it's, it's part of a covenant, really. It's a social compact which the government has with the American people. But in listening to this testimony, what strikes me is this. Uh, first of all, you have a 9 percent yield average over the last 10 years in a solid investment. You, uh, uh, there's no float going on here, so people aren't, uh, the government isn't holding on to the money. They're turning it around as quickly as possible, so uh, the government isn't trying to make more money while people lose money not getting their payments, and that the administrative expenses are, are, are extremely low. Uh, at some point, I know, uh, this Congress is going to get into a debate about those who wish to privatize the Social Security system. And it occurs to me, in hearing this report today uh, about the uh, uh, this money that really is, is held literally in trust, uh, that uh, the American people have a good investment here, that it is solid, that it's being watched uh, very carefully, that uh, the administrative expenses are low. Uh, I, don't, I don't know anything in the private sector that could beat that claim. Uh, when you look uh, at, let's say, the administrative expenses that are, helping, that are happening now in certain um, health care and health management companies in the private sector, uh, they're in the double digits. People are raking millions and hundreds of millions in profits, individuals, at the expense of 
of patients involved in a healthcare system. And, and the, ma the, the, the management costs are, are out of sight. And yet here you have administrative expense of 1.4 percent. Why? Because this isn't a private entity making a profit. This is the United States government holding people's money in trust and, and, and g gaining interest on it in a fully secured investment. Uh, we don't see where, uh, when the stock reports are given daily, advanced, uh, declined, and unchanged, where somebody uh, adds a disclaimer and says, well, granny, sorry, the stocks went down today. You're not going to get the money you uh, back that you invested in Social Security. The United States investment is solid. And uh, I'm, I'm very impressed when I hear this report from the um, Social Security Administration about its finances because uh, this is a cardinal principle of the American government that we make sure that we secure the retirement of our people. And the only way you can do that is make sure it's managed correctly. If the financial management is not sound, then we can't be sure that people's security uh, in, their, in their senior years or if they're disabled is going to be intact. So this is an important uh, moment, I think, to uh, hear from you and to get the assurance of how rock solid this program is and to know that um, this is one of the important functions of the government. And it works. It works. And I'm, uh, I, I have a couple other questions here, but this, you know, just responding to this report, I'd have to say that I'm, uh, as one member of Congress in this committee, I I'm satisfied that, that you're watching the, the t not only the taxpayers' money, but the money that's in this trust fund I want to get back to some questions that uh, Mr. Horn asked uh, about the uh, overpayments. Uh, what do you do to try to decrease the overpayments in the future of the SSI in particular? Um, we, we've been uh, putting a plan together to manage the SSI program better because uh, we see the issue to be more largely of, of overpayments. Um, it is a complex program both for our people to manage and for our beneficiaries to understand. Areas that we're aiming to improve is that we're going to be expanding uh, computer matching, making them more frequent, broadening the areas we computer match, because we've found that one of the reasons we have overpayments is we lag behind finding people if they have wages, wages changes or forget to report something. We think with increased computer matches we can get there. We're working to train our employees better so that when someone comes to the door, our employees know what kind of information to dig for, what to alert them for if they aren't getting all the information they should be getting. Uh, we want to strengthen some of our debt collection activities. Uh, we've been using the tax uh, refund offset program through Treasury, and we have collected over $20 million from folks that are getting tax returns that owe us on SSI, and we've been recovering that money. In the fraud area with the Inspector General, we have been increasing and expanding the size of the Inspector General's office. We've been putting more investigators out on the street in the communities. And with the Inspector General, we've been working closely to target into areas where we think we're most susceptible for fraud. Uh, we found, for instance, in residence border areas, parts of the country, people don't quite tell us what their residency is, and they're living outside the country and collecting SSI. Thanks to the good work with the Inspector General, we've been jumping on those kinds of issues. Uh, we've also initiated a, a large program to make sure we track down all prisoners. We now get virtually 100 percent report on every prisoner in this country that's over 30 days uh, detention so that we're able to cut off their benefits um, as soon as it comes to our attention. Then we can do this largely through matching. The Congress has given us a bounty program through SSI, and that's very effective. We've paid $4 million now to local prisons to date on that, and we just got started. Another area we're looking at is nursing homes. Um, once someone enters into a nursing home, what we pay drops down to a very small amount, if any. And we're working now with uh, HICFA so that we can get data quicker so when people enter nursing programs on SSI, we can target in and find that and cut off payments if it's inappropriate. Thanks to the help of the Congress, we're increasing the number of continuing disability reviews we're doing. In the past, we were only doing a couple hundred thousand. Uh, this year, we'll do over 1.2 million, which in essence is we go out and review the records of people who are currently on disability who we think there's a chance that um, maybe they have gotten well or something or their circumstances have changed. We've also asked the Congress to give us additional funds and authority so we can do more uh, redeterminations. This is where we actually review the financial status of people on SSI. And we have several other areas and initiatives we're going to be pursuing uh, aggressively.
I, I, just a uh, quick question, which I'll get back to in the next round, to Mr. Williams. Do you, uh, do you actually analyze the software that uh, SS, um, the Social Security Administration uses do, do you, as to its efficacy in both handling the massive number of accounts and in, um, uh, in its overall uh, effect on financial management? If I may, I'd like to get some of the other people at the table involved. They're closer to that. Uh to that question, and we can tell you the degree to which we, uh, we examine the software. And um, to a large extent, what we do is uh, um, look at the process uh, that they use to update their software rather than to really analyze the software ourselves. Um, we we uh, look at the results of what the software produces, like if, if we believe that um, there are certain aspects of the program where there should be edit checks to ensure that um, that the software is catching people who, let's just use an example, that um, someone files a disability claim and their date of birth um, is after that date. So we'll look at those kinds of aspects of the software to ensure that it's catching, you know, things that, that it should. And we also look at the, the process that they use to change the software to make sure that it has proper controls and that um, software can't be released without um, the, the right controls in place to ensure that it's accurate. Um, we also look at the process they use to determine if there's any more timely way that they can update their software. We're all, um, sir, we're also present at key testing events along with the agency. We try to independently assess the, uh, the manner in which the test proceeds and the success are, are problems in the testing. Dan, is there When we, uh, Mr. Chairman, when uh, we get back, if, are we going to have one more round at least? Okay, then I, in the next round I want to get into some of the more finer points on software and uh, hardware. Thanks. think on some of the discussion as to the trust fund and to the use of government bonds, we will have a special hearing with my colleague and others on the Treasury coming in here because you have no control over day-to-day -day market operations as I remember. That's the function of the Secretary of the Treasury or if they're involved with the Federal Reserve in some way. So we will uh, have a hearing in the next few months to get at how are these large trust funds managed. Because the point here is not privatization. The point is, does the person that has put hard-earned money in, half of that payment comes from the employee. And the employer, as they look at it, it's the whole payment because they're paying a particular wage, of which roughly 15% is taken out every payday, half and half, employer and employee. And I think that's been a very good model. The question is, are the recipients of Social Security getting as much money as they should get if the funds were properly invested? That's the question. You go to Chile, everybody has a passbook in their hand. I don't know if that's a good system or a bad system. Don't have the slightest idea. But I know we are going to have a national debate on this to educate people. And we don't want, uh, you know, screwy investments that are somebody playing games like they did in the SNL days. But what we do want is to see if that interest that uh, is in your consolidated financial statement, that about, uh, what was it, 40 some mi uh, billion, wasn't it? that you're getting an interest, interest there. Yes, and uh, is that the best we can do? If you're in the state employee's retirement program, as I am in California, it's an unbelievable success. They're into the market. And if they don't like management, their votes sure count on throwing them out. And the result is free health care is provided for retirees, all the rest of it. And uh, I think that is the issue that will be looked at, is there more that can be done if we get off from a somewhat antiquated way, although I agree completely with my colleagues that government bonds ought to be the last thing that we have a problem with. When the market goes down, government bonds generally go up. 
and uh, we just need to look at how that judgments are made by the Treasury because they have a tremendous impact on your operation. Uh, unless we're just sitting there saying, oh, well, you know, we're lucky this time. Government bonds seem to be doing better than the market. I agree. Full faith and credit of the United States is behind them. And uh, we want to keep it that way. On the other hand, we ought to look at what are the options and have an intelligent discussion, not a bunch of demagoguery, which is what we've had in the past when this subject comes up, but an intelligent discussion as what are the needs. Uh, I know hundreds of people on Social Security. They get 500 a month. Now, how do you live on 500 a month in Southern California, in New York, in the great urban cities of America? Uh, it's not easy, and uh, we want to make sure the 500's there, but it would be nice if we could make sure that interest is also getting a better return uh, for its dollars uh, than uh, perhaps it is getting. But that isn't your area, that's the Treasury's area, and uh, we will work with them and uh, with you to look at the whole picture. Let me get back to these three categories. I want to systematically get at this. And we talked about here the SSI, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the, uh, uh, the large Social Security retirement program. We're talking 43 million people, and you're saying roughly 18 percent of the hotline tips or the written tips that come to you. I assume you're including everything. With we are including the including internet and faxes yeah. and we right. have the works. vehicles. But the total was about 18,000 and is that the last fiscal year? Is that fiscal year 97's data? What is it? Okay. Yes uh, sir, that is and I'm told that it's that's a, that's a fairly stable number for the current uh, okay. period as well. Then, then, you, uh, then you have uh, uh, the, uh, well I've got this figure a little off here. Uh, you're saying, is there, are you saying 18 percent of the 43 million would be the figure on where possible misuse is or alleged misuse because you haven't completed analysis of the claims, although you've got 95 data, mm -hmm. and I guess I could ask you to what extent did you produce how much from fraudulent claims in 95 mm -hmm. among the large retiree population? Right. If I may, um the, these percentages I'm giving you, as you said, regard the allegations that arrive, certainly not the, all the 44 million people there. For those, it would be quite small. Of the allegations we receive, about 18 percent regard the, regard the Social Security program, 22 percent regard the SSI program, and 60 percent regard um, misuse of the numbers, right. the, the, uh, the Social Security number for some criminal involvement. And has that been pretty consistent as you look at the 95 data and the 96 data? And we haven't got, uh, well, I guess that is 97 data. Has that been a fairly consistent proportion? Yes, sir. <coughs> well, uh, explain to me how that state disability program does. You fund it, the states administer it. Uh, to what extent is that, uh, is that program have particular fraudulent aspects? Within, um, of course, we have a disability program within Social Security and within SSI. The, um, the, and the administration of those, uh, we were encountering the same sorts of things. The, the administration is fairly good, but we have, we have numbers of allegations that uh, come in, those are our highest dollar losses because the, the payments are, um, are more substantial and over, and, and now they're over a rather long period of time as well. The, w what we've encountered there is that it's a bit higher as well in, in uh, SSI as opposed to disability claims within, within SSA. The, the and actually this is going back to a question that you asked a little earlier, the type of, of uh, frauds that were involved that we're encountering on the SSI side involve both eligibility kinds of issues, income, as well as fraudulent claims of, of uh, fraud. We found that uh, in the, it, it's my impression from having been there for over two years, 
that the state DDSs the, 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 who make the determinations on um, eligibility are, are very vigilant. They do a very good job. Their instincts are good because of the referrals we receive from them. As you said, their, their, their quality is, is very high from both the public and the DDSs. We're, we've just begun an, op an operation called Operation Contender in which we're sending investigative units inside the DDSs to watch suspicious cases as they pass by. We know that the early kind of findings we'll, we'll get there are claimants that are committing fraud. What we really hope to find, though, are the service providers because um, the, the doctors and attorneys that may be involved. So, and, and all of that's going to give us greater intelligence to answer the kinds of questions that, uh, that you're getting to, which are, which are the most important, I, I understand. We, we want to know how hard we're getting hit and, and how we're getting hit. These, we're watching the operations both to try to arrest people but also to understand that issue. I was uh, particularly pleased to hear your favorable comments in terms of electronic direct deposit. Yes. Uh, there's no question it helps cut off the local gang from taking Aunt Minnie's $500 check out of her box because they know when the checks arrive. Mm -hmm. And that was a major problem. And I never could understand why the AARP fought against that. And uh, I don't know if they've changed their position or not, but it was counter to the good welfare of the average citizen to get that check in the bank without a lot of hands touching it, which is what happens sometimes on the postal box situation. And I've got some horrible cases every congressman does in their district office where the check has disappeared, we're phoning you. Your people, by the way, are very good on their legislative relations in the field. The Laguna de Gale group couldn't be better. But uh, those are the helpful hints and, uh, that we all uh, get out of them. And, uh, the helpfulness, uh, and that means a lot to those individuals. They can't afford to miss a payment if they're still paying on a mortgage or whatever. That's, so, that's true. Uh, although I've heard that uh, on the year 2000 problem, the uh, Social Security Administration uh, has realized recently that uh, their state disability program <laughs> computing hasn't quite been in conformity now. I don't know if you're aware of how that's coming along or what. I'd be glad to address that, Mr. Chairman. Um, we are, have a plan in place now that we're working with the state agencies that by the end of this calendar year, we will have them in compliance with the year 2000. I think it's 22 states to date are already compliant, and the rest are working there. We have a work group with the states and with our systems people that are focused on this. Um, I'm reported about how it's going on a monthly basis, if not more frequently. It looks to us like it's under control, and uh, we're comfortable. Uh, on the collection rate on the debt, uh, the, uh, what, what is the collection rate on the debt? It results from a detected overpayments, say, in Supplemental Security Income Program. Is there a, uh, where are we on that? If there's an overpayment, do we get back half of them, a fourth of them, two-thirds, what? Um, I, I don't have handy the, the data for the SSI, but for overall, the percent of debt collected in 97 was 38.9, let me see, total debt, 38.9 percent. And if you look at the uh, amount of debt that we identify and overall how much of clearance we've had in the financial statement in SSI, we identify about a billion of dollars and we're clearing about 800 million clearances. So we're behind what's coming through. And as, I, as I've told you, we're putting in a lot of actions to start to address this. Yeah. Now, is a lot of that debt on overpayment based on the earnings limitation? Uh, some is based on earnings. Others is um, based on financial assets that people have that we weren't aware of or that they maybe forgot to tell us. Uh, other areas, it's just uh, misunderstanding living arrangements. Uh, people's living arrangements change. That adjusts. So there are various re returning to work. People will start getting money on that. They forget, living, they forget does, to tell us they've returned to work. Does, quote, living arrangement, unquote, include marriage or not marriage? I mean, is Social Security keeping people apart? We, don't, we try not to. Well, you know, that, that earnings limitation. We, we look at ourselves me. as a family protection program, yeah. not, a, 
how to disrupt the program. Well, the earnings limitation has annoyed me for 40 years, and I'm glad to say Congress is finally phasing it out and getting rid of it. I never understood why Congress put it in when, in the 30s, was that earnings limitation put in? I mean, it's just a crazy thing. It was from the I've beginning. Uh, you know, we ought to be encouraging people to work and still get their Social Security based on when they put it into the system. You know, we ought to keep people moving, get the brain working, and not just sit around watching television. And uh, the earnings limitation is just counterproductive to what we know about human beings who age successfully. They keep themselves busy. And yet we're saying, hey, you can't go down and earn a minimum wage even if it's beyond that. Uh, that bothers me, and I'm glad Congress is finally making some progress in this area and getting rid of it. I don't know, it's going to take a few more years before we completely get rid of it, I believe. I don't know if you have that handy, but uh, it's a phase out, as I remember. I think it's 2002, we get to 30,000. Yeah. So the good news will come. That'll get rid of that awful thing immediately. Okay, as part of the office's response uh, in the, uh, to the Price Waterhouse 97 audit, the Social Security Administration indicated it did not have sufficient information to respond to specific recommendations. As SAA, uh, SSA receives sufficient information at this point to fully respond to the auditor's recommendations and are the auditors comfortable with the agency's action plan? I'm going to, I can tell you uh, the last thing first. We're, okay. We've been, there were, as we pointed out, there were five deficiencies that were found and that, that we were, we were certainly in agreement with. We've been through the first two of those and there's been a, a very high level of consensus with regard to the solution on those. As Mr. Dyer said, we hope that by July we, it will all be completed and between now and then we'll learn about the agency's response on the, the final three. John, I'm sorry to have gone first, no, but uh, I thought he was directing it to you, so I always defer to the IG. Um, in terms of uh, responding to Price Waterhouse, uh, we've done it in two phases, Mr. Chairman. There were the two recommendations on protection of data and continuity of operations. We received from Price Waterhouse earlier their management report in the background. There were over some 60 recommendations, and right now there's only about two that we really, I think, have any difference, and they're not that uh, major in terms of uh, our materiality or whatnot. On the other three... What are the, what are the two? Uh, the two that we're down to, let me see if I can remember. Uh, one is that uh, they recommended that when someone, when one of our employees enters our data security center, that we should make them go through an x-ray machine. Uh, we think that they should be able to just be checked, their pass checked. We've got pass, their ID'd. Uh, they have security codes to get access as they go into the building. And we've checked with uh, Department of Judge, Justice and GSA standards, and they don't require using metal detectors for entering if you have an employee. Obviously, someone from the outside coming in, we would take them through and, and search them thoroughly. Is Our, their concern based on these unfortunate shootings that have occurred, particularly in the post office and other federal agencies where somebody fires somebody who's been incompetent for years and they finally fire them and then they come back and kill the supervisor? No. Now, is that their worry? No, their, their worry more when you run a data security center is sabotage, uh, that someone could enter and... Uh, With a magnet? Mag well, okay. a magnet or start a fire, place a bomb, and destroy all the records and valuables and the computers. I mean, our computer center is worth a fortune and it houses a lot of data. We obviously have backup for the computer center if everything would happen, but we uh, treat it with tremendous security. It's a secured site, and that's, uh, but that is, is one of the I must say, I think that's pretty good advice on the part of the auditors. I, I feel better when I'm on an airplane every weekend to Long Beach, California, that we've all gone through that security system. Now, if somebody's sort of, uh, uh, dating the other security person and they're making eyes at each other and not watching the screen. We worry about that once in a while, but they've improved that. And uh, I think the fact that uh, people aren't carrying guns on that plane uh, or bombs or anything else make a lot of us feel very good about it. 
And I would think in a big agency such as yours, I don't know, have you had any of these shooting the supervisor bits in Baltimore? Uh, not uh, shooting supervisors directly, but we have had times when the offices have been held hostage or supervisors have been held at gunpoint by people that are upset about something. Yeah, not were they upset about a social security issue or just upset, upset. you're a target? Sometimes it's not even a social security issue. They're, they're upset or they're having domestic problems internally in their family and, and a member of the family comes looking for an employee. I'm not aware of that we've actually had an employee, uh, you know, pull a gun or do something like that with a supervisor, but I, I'm not going to trust my memory on that. But we do have incidences. And in offices where we have a higher risk of that, we do use metal detectors. Uh, are, do, are you uh, familiar with the uh, federal uh, uh, workers' comp program administered by the Department of Labor? Just a little bit. I, I just wonder, historically, some of you from Social Security I know have good memories on this. Was that ever considered to be part of the Social Security Administration? No. Never was. So it's, it predates Social Security, does it? Or? It was in the original act, but yeah. we were not given the you were job of administering it. Because we will be holding hearings on that program in the next six months. Uh, we've been concerned with all the complaints we've heard about it. And I warned the secretary, the previous one, Mr. Reich, I said, you know, you might want to clean it up before we get there and get some things on the table. But I was just wondering, because it seems to me you do a lot of that work all the time in terms of disabilities. And uh, I don't know why we uh, have other programs that don't do it as well as you do it. And uh, maybe that's a possible option. I know you aren't anxious to grab any more territory, but uh, maybe for the good of the cause, you might want to think about it. Uh, the Office of Inspector General has been the responsible for auditing SAA's financial statements since the fiscal year 87, as I remember it. In what areas of financial management does your office believe the agency has made substantial progress? Where is it the most substantial progress? Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask the, the people at the table to join me. We've examined um, that are in areas that are sort of on point for the continuum of, of uh, concerns. We've looked at physical security and system security, and we can provide you with, with all that work, separation of duties and backup and recovery systems for, that, that Mr. Dyer was alluding to earlier and change controls. We're, we're a fairly new office. We're only two years old uh, and the, those other audits predated our, our mm -hmm. existence. But I'd like Mr. Devlin to, uh, to, to respond on um, the progress. In the most recent years, I think the biggest uh, contribution they've made is in the presentation of the financial statements. Uh, as it relates to estimating uh, the amount that's owed back to the Social Security Administration. There was a long process where uh, the balance for the accounts receivable uh, was not auditable. Um, since that time, uh, SSA has implemented a progressive um, system to put into place a better means for identifying amounts due back and to presenting an accurate auditable balance on the financial statements. Uh, that's probably the, and that for the, lo for the longest time was a condition that prevented us from expressing a clean opinion on the financial statements. Um, since that time, we can now audit that balance. Uh, and that's, uh, to my knowledge, was probably the last piece that got us to the clean opinion. The agency's also made very impressive progress during the short time I've there with regard to um, being very aggressive toward fraud, and, and actually Mr. Dyer, who's here, uh, was probably the most important figure in that. Um, there have been tremendous increases in the amount of um, arrests and indictments and dollars recovered, and, and it's in the hundreds of percent increase um, since I've been there. And, and uh, there's a very close, the closest I've ever seen, I've been in a number of agencies, relationship between the agency and the investigators to, to make sure that that's a seamless uh, attack on fraud. And, and I've, I've been very impressed, and Mr. Dyer is certainly uh, one of the very important reasons for that. Well, I think he appreciates it, and I appreciate it. What areas of financial management does your office believe the agency still needs to address? Mm -hmm. 
Um, there, there is an area that relates to financial management that's not immediately evident on the, on the financial statements, and it has to do with, uh, with developing an adequate cost accounting system. Uh, the Inspector General alluded to that um, in his testimony. Um, the ability to be able to uh, estimate and actually quantify the cost of delivering government services and at the same time capture and measure the related effect, the benefit, um, requires uh, an accounting system that uh, the Social Security Administration currently has but has been identified as, a, as an area that really needs uh, a good look. The uh, General Accounting Office uh, worked with the, um, the firm of uh, Pricewaterhouse to look at the existing cost accounting system and found that uh, it's 20 years old, uh, that it's, uh, it's labor intensive, uh, that it rests upon methodologies and assumptions that really haven't been looked at for quite some time. Uh, we think that that may be indi an, an indication of other areas of financial management that aren't necessarily immediately evident in the, in the financial statements that really do need a good strong look uh, as the agency starts to look at the eventual implementation down the road of uh, the Government Performance and Results Act. Uh, so I would say cost accounting mm -hmm. is a is a big yeah, build on that it, for a moment, if I may. That sure. The government did a one government thinking did a 180 on that um, a few years back. It it was considered the most economical strategy to combine all of the costs and to not go into the the trouble and the labor intensity of tracking each program. We now understand that uh, you can't get a good feel for the return on investment and and for whether or not you want to expand or, or cut off investments without that kind of data. So the, we're, the entire government's trying to catch up in this area, but, and uh, we're such a big agency that, that uh, although we're taking it very seriously and I think we'll be successful, I, I would agree that that's the one, we're, that's the greatest challenge that faces us um, financially. Well, I've ex overextended my time. I'll yield uh, 25 minutes to the gentleman from Ohio. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and, and again, it's uh, such a pleasure to serve with you on this committee that uh, I would be happy to sit here for large amounts of time just to listen to your participation because you've been a leader on so many of these issues, and I'm yeah, glad to be here. I am lunch yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, uh, you know, I'm, as I go over this report from the uh, Social Security Administration, uh, there are a number of things that I th are uh, that come to mind. First of all, I note that your, um, when you talk about some of your key missions, agency goals, rebuild public confidence in Social Security is, uh, is one of them. That's on page nine, I believe. I, I'd like to talk to you a moment about that. Uh, first of all, when you send the monthly checks to people, or, or any payments that you send, whether it's Social Security or SSI or Black Lung or whatever, do you, uh, do you just send a check or do you include any message with it at all? Uh, sometimes we include messages, uh, various messages from when there's a COLA adjustment or, for instance, we're encouraging direct deposit. Uh, we will insert messages. Department of Treasury will insert messages for other purposes, too. Well, let me uh, offer you uh, some advice here. As someone, my, my own background's in communications. That's my educational background that I bring to the Congress. I have a master's in communications from a school in Cleveland known as Case Western Reserve University. And communication, effective communication, involves a structured series of messages. Now, utility companies have known for a long time the importance of getting information in monthly to their customers when they send a bill. They'll have those little fold-ins which have information about the service, about the, uh, if people have a concern about their utility bills, other than the fact that we all know they're too high. And there's a, a consistent message that's sent out to people. It, it seems to me that, uh, that Social Security in particular, uh, in its effort to build public confidence and to state its delivery, would benefit from a consistent communication uh, with such a structured series of messages which would um, indicate over and over what this system is about and, uh, and, and the service functions which are available. 
and I'm not talking just once. I mean, it's, it's since you contact people every month, uh, it gives you a tremendous opportunity to communicate with the public about Social Security. I'd go one step further to say that it's particularly important at this time because you have uh, various interests in Wall Street who are just you know, waiting to get their hands on that trust fund. And the public, I think, needs to know, again, about the mission of, so of Social Security, how it was started, why it was started, who benefits. I just want to read, if I may, uh, from uh, some passages from the report. This, this was not in your testimony, but it's certainly the report is part of the record. And I, I, I would assume uh, uh, that uh, as an appendix to, to this hearing today, we could submit this, and I'd like to do that uh, uh, without, without objection. Put in the record. Thank you. But, uh, some of the, there's a story told here in this report that I, I think is so important. Uh, first of all, and quoting directly, in 1996, the family income of 16 percent of aged, unmarried beneficiaries uh, fell below the poverty line. Without Social Security benefits, 61 percent of those beneficiaries would have income below the poverty line. That's a, dis uh, a difference of 45 percent due to receipt of Social Security. Uh, this, is, this is a program that's fundamentally important by its definition, Social Security. It is securing the social and economic position of millions of Americans. Talks about aged couples. This is another quote. For aged couples, Social Security also lifted many couples out of poverty. In 1996, 3% of aged beneficiaries who were members of a, uh, of a married couple had income below the poverty line. Without Social Security benefits, 41% of these beneficiaries would have income below the poverty line, a difference of nearly 38%. It's another fact from this report. 95% of people aged 65 or over in calendar year 1997 were receiving benefits or will when their spouses retire. The largest category of beneficiaries over age 65 is retired workers. About 98 percent of children under 18 and spouses with children in their care under 16 can count on benefits if a working parent dies. Then this report goes on to say, and this is a quote, while many of the nation's aged population have income from other sources, a portion of the beneficiary population relies heavily on Social Security. For 18 percent of beneficiaries, it is the only income. For 30 percent of the population, it contributes almost all of the income. And for 66 percent of beneficiary units, it is the major income source. I think uh, as we review this financial report, we have to put it in a human context. Because we're not just talking about numbers here. The people, millions of people whose very existence depends on how these numbers are put together, but we're talking about people. And somewhere there is somebody who received their check, and that was important in helping uh, pay the rent and buy food and enabling people to survive. Uh, that's what these checks do. People wait for those checks to arrive. And people are very sensitive to Social Security because their whole lives sometimes revolve around that check uh, arriving or going into their account. I would say one thing, perhaps the difficulty you had with direct deposit in accepting it is the fact that, you know, part of the ceremony of a uh, monthly ceremony in many households, the rival the check. People want to see it. They want to touch it. <laughs> they want to look at it. They want to look at their name and the amount and then do with it. It's a question of autonomy here. I can understand it. I really do understand it. But I go back to what I said to you, uh, Mr. Dyer. Uh, is there anything that would would stop you from communicating more frequently with your, uh, with the Social Security recipients? Uh, 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 Mr. Congressman, we agree with you that we need a concerted uh, communication plan. Uh, we, a year or two ago, set up a separate Deputy Commissioner for Communications. So organizationally, we now have a focal point, real emphasis on that. In terms of what we've been doing this year um, with the President asking for a national dialogue on Social Security and looking at how to reform it in the future, 
Uh, we have been involving our employees in our offices to be out in the community to assist communities in having forums. Uh, we've been working, as you know, with uh, Pew Association, ARP and others. Uh, the President personally hasn't been involved in this. So we're trying to systematically put out the message of what is Social Security about? As you mentioned, how it uh, provides a major amount of income for the elderly that are retired, its importance, uh, how it works, uh, that it's not only just a retirement program, but it's also a survivor's insurance program and for disabled people. Make sure f people understand that three out of ten people now that are in the labor market will become disabled. Um, so we want to explain it. The other uh, tool that we've been using uh, besides working in schools and other places and making ourselves available to speak uh, systematically is we have what we call the personal earnings benefit statement, uh, which the Congress asked us to, to start to issue a few years back. And by the year 2000, we will be sending it out to everybody who's 25 years or old. And what it does is it tells them how much they would get upon retirement based on what their earnings are now. It also, if they want, we will run for them calculations of if they make assumptions of what additional earnings they might make, what they would get from us upon retirement. And in that pamphlet, as we send out that information, we're going to be adding a lot of the messages you just shared with me. I think that's me. so important because uh, those who have a pecuniary interest in trying to take over Social Security are trying to precipitate an intergenerational war to have uh, the young, who are, the, who are income producers right now, uh, uh, abandon Social Security. Uh, and, and the fact of the matter is, if you are communicating, uh, if wage earners do have information mm -hmm. about the money they have in there and, and how solid it is and how it will be there for them, uh, there is uh, more assurance and I think public confidence in Social, social Security. Because people who've had contact with the system know that it works. You know, your level, of, the level of public confidence, which you mentioned in your report, I, I think relates to those who've had contact with the system. Because how could you have contact with the system and not have confidence in it? Because the check's there. This isn't the story of the check's in the mail. The check arrives. Go back to this, though. I would, uh, I, I would urge you to consider putting a few, you know, using that month, the monthly occasion. Now, I know you have direct deposit. That might change it in some cases. But you do have a chance to communicate with people yes, sir. and to use it more often. And it becomes more important now in the next uh, few months and years. I, I would also like to um, uh, point out uh, from your overview of SSA, you mentioned that most elderly Americans were living in poverty in 1935 when the Social Security Act established a program to protect aged Americans against loss of income due to re retirement. Now, you know, we used to hear euphemisms about the poorhouse, uh, but we don't, you know, we don't have a, an, an aged population. Now, we have, sure, we have some elderly poor we're very concerned about, but that's an issue away from Social Security. Uh, there is a, um, uh, this Social Security Act has worked, and that needs to be said uh, in this context of a financial report. Now, I note in your re uh, accountability report uh, under support to other programs, you talk about Medicare, uh, where the uh, Social Security Administration is the primary public contact point for the Health Care Financing Administration, and that you provide key services to the Medicare program. Uh, could you tell me about that? Sure. What, 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 you know, about the contact between you and Medicare and what the services are that you provide? Yeah, the, the, the services we provide are that when someone retires, we at the same time um, get them their uh, Medicare card. We work through that so they can buy, sign up for Medicare because they're eligible at 65. Uh, secondly, we find that a, a lot of people come to our offices or call us on our 800 number uh, with questions that relate to Medicare, and we work as a liaison to get them to the intermediaries and carriers who will handle their problems about their bills or whatever is going on. We also provide information to people uh, coming in on Medicare of some of their options. And, and now, as you know, there are different choices for managed care. We, ha we have to be able to provide basic information as to where they can go to get additional information or what they need. So, so you serve as a referral program 
Well, we serve as enroll in Medicare, and, and then we uh, try to answer what we can. But a lot of questions, if it has to do with billing, we don't have that capacity. You have to go to the intermediaries and carriers, the Blue Cross Blue Shields, to do that. Do you have, do you have, interf now, do you get any kind of reimbursement from Medicare for the expenses yes. that you incur as a result of this? Yes. Part, part of our administrative budget, uh, we are reimbursed by the Medicare trust funds. It's about $800 million a year. Eight hundred million a year. Okay, now uh, you refer people to uh, health maintenance organizations. I take it. Well, we will uh, tell people where they can get in contact with resources to help them go there. We don't let actually say particular ones, but we can say if you're interested, here's a list of what's there. And uh, we rely on um, HICFA to carry the ball beyond us in terms of the front. Uh, point. And I guess we're going to get into HICFA next week. Is that yeah, right, Mr. That's Chairman? Correct. Do, do you, uh, you you provide people with a list? Yes, we'll give, help them give them information, give them res access to What's on to the list? It would be the list of what are the various HMOs that they could qualify for or apply to. We get this information from HICFA and from the local community groups. So you basically give them a list you get from HICFA? It's not a list right. that you independently verify? No. We, we rely on HICFA for those kind of resources. Now, obviously, if our staffs and the offices are in the region, see that there's something inadequate or wrong with the list, we'll correct it. I'd be interested in getting a copy of the list, which yeah. uh, well, I'll which get you samples Hickford of the kind you, of information. Which you give to. Okay. That will be put in the record at this point. Would that be? Uh, I appreciate that, yeah. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. As, as far as, uh, tell me about the administration of the black lung program how many beneficiaries do you have right now gosh i'm trying the number keeps decreasing i think it's under a million now 700,000 i have to get it for the record but it's been decreasing because uh we we've been handling the the folks that were prior to 73 if i remember rightly so our group is slowly passing away and it's been phasing down. And in fact, this last year, we signed a memorandum of understanding with the uh, Department of Labor, and um, we're gonna, they're going to actually start doing the cases for us, and we'll monitor their performance, because it's so more closely related to the kind of work they do. But we do get reimbursed for the activities, again, of our administrative dollars. We're reimbursed by the Black Lung Program for what we spend. Do you have your uh, management and information systems person here? Uh, no. No. Well, I'm the CIO, so I guess, okay. Chief, and I am your match. If you're looking for that, what, I am. What kind person. of computers do you use? Uh, I'm trying to remember. We, we uh, update them so frequently. I think they're IBM computers now. Um, I, be, I focus more, uh, right now the box is a box. I'm more focused in on uh, what kind of power we get out of the boxes and what's the correct configuration of those boxes. Is it Hitachi's now? Well, my general, uh, Inspector General tells the latest we bought were Hitachi's. Mr. Williams? Yes, sir, that's, that's correct. IBM compatible, of course, and, and they did integrate with earlier purchases, but that was that's the current uh, contract. And do they, I, I, I'm interested because uh, there are so many different type computer systems in the government, and some apparently work better than others. Uh, if we could take an accounting report which uh, provides a, a clean accounting for Social Security, and from that we can, uh, it, it, imp it implies that the computer systems that you're using must be pretty good because you don't have a, a fiscal train wreck going on there. Yeah, as we said earlier, the advantage we have is we have a centralized system, mainframe, uh, based in Baltimore, and we run it. And I think, though, the real success there on running it, though, is, is the software we, we run what on it. What is the software that you use? It's software that we predominantly have developed ourselves over years and improved and enhanced. Um, now we're beginning to look at use of more off-the-shelf software for management information systems because there's a lot more out there, as you call them, COTS packages. But we find that with the kind of volume we have, we have so many transactions in such high numbers and volume. Uh, for dealing with our beneficiaries, financial side too, we have relatively high. That sometimes we've had to do our own work because you get into those volumes when we buy off the shelf, we find we have to do a lot of modifications. So we, we look and trade off as to what's our best investment, which way to go.
Uh, is the software development, which is done by the Social Security Administration, is that FOIAble? Can you have, can, can people get information about your software development and use it to set up their own companies? Uh, I, I, most of what we do is so unique to us, I don't think anybody really would uh, be, begin to even use it uh, outside. Well, you know, there are areas of government right. where government develops some products, like the mm -hmm. National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Right. They have public-private partnerships. Uh, we have, uh, I'm trying to remember, I may mix up my days in HICFA, there have been cases I'm aware of where we have worked out software that, yes, the private vendor has used it and sold it to other agencies. Uh, again, I come back to, we found in our case, usually due to our volume and the type of uh, transactions and the history of how we've set up our files, we pretty much have stayed with, continue to develop the software we have. I was just interested to see if anybody's hitched a ride on the expertise that... Uh... Um, the uh, Office of Child Enforcement, for instance, now is, is using our data center. Uh, they've been with us. Uh, they're running on, we're running on our data center. Their files as they're bringing up the new data files that they're required by law to do. And we're working closely with them because we can interact with their data files. Okay, I, uh, I want to I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank you for uh, calling this hearing. Well, I thank you very much. <clears throat> I just have a few more questions, and then if you don't mind, submit the answers to the others that staff on both sides will uh, send to you. Uh, and they're in the more technological areas of the Inspector General. But let me get back to a basic program of yours. And the audit reports uh, discuss the fact that the Social Security Act has a backlog of continuing disability reviews. As I understand it, these disability reviews are intended to ensure that the individuals are entitled to disability insurance benefits. Could you tell me a little bit how the system works? And then sure. does the patient get a doctor? Does the government get a doctor? And how do you resolve some of these things? Well, the, the, the way the system works is that when someone um, becomes, in essence, one of our beneficiaries enters the program, we look to see if we, uh, if we think they have a high probability of uh, recovering, moderate or, or low probability. So we sort of classify the cases. And then what we do is on a systematic basis, uh, we're trying to go on a three-year cycle is what we think is about right. We go and look at the cases with high probability of success. We do it through two ways. Uh, one, we send mailers to people and ask them to fill up some update information. Or secondly, we actually pull the case and uh, we have the person come into our office and we go through a review and actually have the state agencies do a medical review and we update the review. <laughs> Um, in terms of addressing the, the backlog, uh, we expect that by the year 2000 we'll be current with the uh, Title II program, and by the year 2002 we will have finished out the backlog for SSI. What, what's our definition of backlog? When does that kick in? What are you trying to do it in? in? In backlog would be that based on our internal standards of how frequently we should look at a case where we think high probability of improvement to lower, that we are systematically getting to them. As I said, I think memory is about at an average three years. We'd like to see the cases that we think there's some chance the person's condition could change. Well, what kind of a decision is made that gets them on the benefit? Uh, it's, it's done, as I said, it's done through a system. We, our systems kick, kick it out that we've classified. Well, let's say things. I've got a disability and I go yeah. into my friendly oh, Social Security doing. area yeah. office. Yeah. And the question would be, if I'm really suffering, uh, and you determine that, yes, you deserve the appropriate benefit, how long does it take from the time I walk through that door for the first time before the check arrives? Um, if we allow you through the initial process, it can take about 100 days. 100 days. So that's three months plus. Yeah. Okay. And then what's the usual experience here of how long it takes? Well, for the for the... That for about vast majority of people, it is the 100 days or so. It states we're a little different in different parts of the country, but on average, it's 100 days. If you go into the hearings process, where let's say we turn you down at the initial stage, then it can take over a year to two. Uh, the effect of the backlog, I'm just curious, when you've got that jam up, are we talking about several hundred thousand people in the backlog? What are we talking about here? Uh, this, Mr. Chairman, I just want to be sure which backlog we're talking about. Well, just the one on the, uh, the Social Security Disability Reviews. Okay, on the, on the Disability Reviews, the backlog is, I think, about uh, two to three million is where we've been. 
And as I said, we have gone from two years ago doing a couple hundred thousand cases last year to 600,000. This year we'll do 1.3 million. Next year about 1.6 million. So we plan to catch up by the year 2000, 2002. We'll be current. Well, uh, since you've had an increase in it and you're dealing with big numbers now in the millions, does this mean what? That there are truly more disabilities in our nation or is there substantial fraud underway? Uh, I, I think it, it, I'm not sure it always means totally there's fraud. I think sometimes it means that people don't realize that uh, they can go back to work, they've recovered, and they should come to tell us that and drop off. What we found in terms of, I call it net cessations when we do CDRs, that, that after we go through the process, it runs it to two to three, up to five percent of the people that we actually reach out and do a CDR, do we end up taking off our rolls? Uh, now, the effect of the backlog in recognizing individuals that are erroneously receiving benefits, I mean, how many individuals do you really find that are erroneously receiving benefits? Well, as I said, when you net it out, eventually it comes out to about uh, 3 to 5 percent, depending on which type of review. In this we're area, 3 to 5 ultimately, percent. That ultimately we uh, say should not be there. Uh, and you're doing what to solve the problem? More people or a different have, process have, or what? We have increased the number of people involved in the state agencies. We've moved it up to be a priority in the agency. Uh, we are now also working on the systems so that we can better track and follow through to see what we are finding, what the recovery rates are, the number of people coming off as a result of being very precise. Now, this disability program is essentially administered through the states. Is that correct? It, it's done both through the states and f through the agency employees. Uh, when the beneficiary applies, they come to one of our offices. After the medical review is done by the state, the appeal are again done by uh, SSA employees who are administrative law judges. Mm -hmm. uh, About 30. Participate in this program, or does no, every state? No, we have all, all states participate. All 50 states. While we've been having this exchange over the last hour, uh, the constituent has asked, how does the Social Security Administration account for individuals who continue to collect or accept money on behalf of deceased relatives? In other words, they just don't notify them that Aunt Minnie died and uh, the checks keep coming in. How many cases do you have like that? Uh, I'll have to get you that for the record. I don't have yeah. it with me. But I can see where mischief could be played with that. And yeah. obviously we, we have been trying to set up systems. Uh, for instance, we get reports from the funeral homes, um, and the states give us their vital statistic data, and we also get uh, data from the banks online as banks are notified about cases. For instance, for direct deposit, if the bank hears that the person has deceased and goes to close the account, they let us know simultaneously. I see. So that's automatic with banks? Yeah. So How about county registrars that keep the... To say we get the state vital get statistic. That. Okay. Yeah. So we, uh, we do eventually catch up with it. gentleman from Ohio has a question on yeah, this. As topic. a follow-up to that, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Dyer. If someone uh, passes away and they're, they have been a recipient of Social Security checks, then their, uh, their family, let's say, notifies the bank mm -hmm. and says, lost a loved one, they had direct deposit, let's say, uh, we're not, you know, don't send any more checks. The bank tells Social Security. That's right. I've uh, heard that in some cases, the checks keep coming for a few months. Do you know about uh, the I, things happening I, I'm like that? I'm sure we can always find some cases. Uh, that, that the checks would be coming for a few months yeah. despite people telling the banks. Yeah. Again, is there ever a lag time between the bank notifying the Social Security system? Have you noticed? Maybe even the Inspector General Office would know that. I think there is some lag time. And let me also correct the record. This procedure we put in with the banks is something we've done just in the last few years. Okay. So we, we've it's something we realized we had to do, and we've been working with them on it. We're, we're very interested, as fast as we can, to update our files as to whether or not someone has died for obvious reasons. And anything we can find to do that, we track it down. Well, the Inspector General might want to do a random survey of do the banks even know they have this to, little task to do? 
because banks have a high turnover of personnel and a high turnover of mergers. And one never knows whether you've got any training program or not, or that person might have been hired by another bank and so forth. You might want to look into that, General. Well, Mr. Uh, Chairman, if I, if I could add yeah. that, uh, you know, my concern is, uh, is there, uh, if the banks don't notify Social Security quickly enough uh, and the checks uh, accumulate in the bank, is there a float that develops and the banks uh, can make interest off of that? Sure. Uh, let me just add, uh, my staff just informed me, that 98 percent of people passing away were basically notified by the families. The area we're exposed is about 2 percent is what we find to be that were failure to report to us within a month. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just uh, <coughs> conclude this hearing with making a few comments here. The financial management that we've been studying in various major agencies such as yours, and yours is at sort of the top of the list of people that have done it well, is the foundation for a lot of activities of the federal government. And since we have the Government Results and Performance Act on the books and we're getting strategic plans in at last, they aren't too good for many agencies and they'll be redoing them, but uh, some of them are very good. And obviously the financial management data are absolutely essential in terms of developing appropriate performance goals. Oregon has its benchmark system, which is the only state in the United States that is equal to New Zealand and Australia, which are the only nations in the world that have a sensible government analysis system as to are the programs working or aren't they working? Is the customer satisfied or not? That's the problem Commissioner Rosati faces as he goes over to give the first executive managerial leadership that agencies have ever had. Usually it's tax lawyers and tax accountants. And he's actually run an organization, and he's trying to turn the agency around. It's going to take several years, dedicating 18 hours a day to this thing. And uh, that's uh, why we need to make sure these systems are working and not have the weak financial management we've seen in a number of agencies that have been before us. Billions of taxpayer dollars go unaccounted for, and we all pay the price as a result of that. And the hearings this week have illustrated certainly the consequences of poor financial management before you all came in here. And we're glad to see one agency that's working. That's partly why we made you independent a few years ago and we wanted to get you away from the politicians as much as we could in HHS, among others. So uh, we think uh, what you're doing is uh, doing it very well. I, one of my friends in a previous incarnation was a gentleman by the name of Wilbur Cohen, who was a young man, was one of the three that developed the Social Security Act idea. Wilbur used to carry a list around in his pocket of millionaires who were no longer millionaires and needed Social Security. It was very interesting. When we were writing up Medicare, we practiced a lot of what Social Security had successfully done as the basis for getting the Medicare system going. And even though there are different rates now and all that, the idea was there that this was a conservative way to fund it because the, otherwise Congress was just willy-nilly uh, authorizing programs, never had any income. Uh, they just did it, uh, gee, strangely, just before every election. So uh, Medicare we will look at next week with uh, the Subcommittee on Oversight and the Subcommittee on Health of the House Committee on Commerce, chaired by Mr. Bliley. Uh, he's been kind enough to ask us uh, to join them in this endeavor, and uh, we will be looking at uh, Medicare and possibly Medicaid uh, next week. Uh, last year, uh, it was reported that uh, there was $23 billion in overpayments by the Health Care Financing Administration, some of which were fraudulent. And we'll also be holding a hearing on Tuesday of next week on the inspector generals, and this is the 20th anniversary, as Mr. Williams, the distinguished inspector general, knows, and we uh, want to get further depth in terms of how we get at the waste, fraud, and abuse that a lot of people believe occurs in all levels of government, and it's sort of fascinating when your constituents look at a poll, and now I'm talking a legitimate poll, not just the mail-in, although it's been fantastically strange, that both my mail-in poll and a legitimate public opinion poll have about this exactly the same percentages where they believe most of the fraud is in the federal government, believe it or not, 
and then they get down to the state government, less fraud there, local government, less fraud there. Now, what does that tell us? Does it tell us simply because the local government is there, they see the city council in action, they can touch it, they see their city council person more than they see their U.S. senator or the president or their U.S. representative. And so you have a lot of different factors that go to it, but this is what, as we move toward a results-oriented government where we're looking at particular options that get the job done and have new thinking. And there's no question the cities in America and the counties have been the governments with the new thinking, the new innovation. And uh, we need to apply some of that to the federal government, even in an agency that is generally very well run, uh, such as uh, the Social Security Administration. So I thank you for coming. I want to thank the staff that uh, prepared this hearing, Jay Russell George, the staff director, general counsel to the subcommittee, uh, Diane Ginsberg, uh, a detailee from the general accounting office, professional staff member of the staff, Mr. Hines, John Hines, professional staff member, Matthew Ebert, the clerk and staff assistant to the committee, uh, Mason Allinger, the uh, staff assistant, David uh, Cohear, the intern from USC, University of Southern California, Cammie White, an intern, and Faith Weiss, the uh, professional staff member for the minority, and I'm not sure who else is here. Uh, and Jean Gosa, the clerk for the uh, minority, and Julie Moses, a uh, professional staff member. And then we thank our court reporters, uh, Doreen uh, uh, Dotzler and Katrina Wright. And with that, we're in recess until our hearings next week.